morning. My name is Kelly Legrand Wiener, and I'm the managing attorney at Scott Legal. Today, we're going to spend some time talking about H-1B visas and specifically the H-1B lottery. Uh, a few things before we get started. Uh, Scott Legal is a full service immigration firm that processes H-1B visas regularly, and we're very familiar with the H-1B lottery. Uh, our founder, Ian Scott, has actually been on an H-1B visa and so is very familiar with, um, with the entire process and what you're going through as an applicant. We will continue our webinar series doing at least two webinars a month on various different topics. After this webinar, we will send you a few different things. Um, you know, one will be an H-1B uh, comprehensive guide, and we'll also send a link to where you can sign up for additional webinars. Uh, for our panelists today, we're very lucky to have Michaela Vrazdova, who is a senior associate at Scott Legal and has significant experience processing H-1B visas and with the H-1B registration system. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Kelly Legrand Wiener, and I'm the managing attorney at the firm, and I'm also uh, very familiar with H-1B visas and have processed many of them. If you have questions throughout the presentation, uh, please send them in the chat box. We will make time for questions at the end of the presentation, or if it's relevant to what we're talking about, um, you know, we may answer it um, as they come in. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on demand. So uh, we will now get started by um, Michaela. If you could please um, tell us uh, how many H-1B petitions can be adjudicated each year? Um, and how many registrations are generally submitted each year? Yeah, so um, good morning, everyone. Um, so each year, um, the government can adjudicate um, 85,000 um, H-1B petitions. Um, and each year, um, or, or recently in the last couple of years, um, more H-1B registrations are submitted um, than the 85,000 um, quota. Um, for example, last year, um, around like 480,000 um, H-1B registrations were submitted, and the government can only adjudicate 85,000 petitions. Um, so what the government does um, is that they run an H-1B um, lottery um, through um, like an online system, and they randomly select um, 85,000 petitions um, they, will, um, they will adjudicate. And from the 85,000 petitions, um, 65,000 petitions um, are can be submitted um, on behalf of anyone who has either um, a bachelor's degree or um, perhaps a work experience that is equivalent to bachelor's degree. And then um, 20,000 um, spots um, are reserved for people um, who have a master's degree from um, a U.S. university. Um, so, so yeah, that's how the H-1B lottery works. Perfect. Thank you. Um, could you talk a little more about kind of, um, in terms of the lottery, you know, when does it open? Um, how is the registration submitted and when are employers notified about whether they're selected in the lottery? Yeah. So, um, USCIS just, um, released, um, the detailed guidance about the dates, um, when the system will open, um, on Friday, um, so the registration system this year will open on March 1st and will close on uh, March 17. Um, so the, the U.S. companies, the employers will be able to submit um, the H-1B registration um, from March 1st to March 17. Um, then the, the system will close and at the end of March, um, the government will run the lottery and um, the employers should be, um, the, the selected employers should be notified um, around like March 31st or, or beginning of April, um, whether their um, registrations um, were selected. And so basically how, um, so what's the H-1B kind of like registration system? So um, in the past, um, like two, three years, um, the government kind of like switched um, and, and now all the registrations are uh, being submitted um, through this online USCIS system. Um, so if you are an employer, um, you will have to go and create um, a USCIS account um, on a, uh, through a USCIS website. Um, this year, you will be able to create the system um, starting February 21st. Um, so um, if, you, if you want to kind of like set up the system in advance, um, you will be able to do it starting uh, February 21st. 
um, you will have to input um, you know certain information in the in the system such as your you know email address like what's your um, title in the in the company um, and things like that um so um and yeah and then when the h1b lottery opens on march 1st you will then be able to um submit the h1b registrations through the system or um if you decide to hire um an immigration attorney to do the registration for you um the the attorney will basically prepare um the entire h1b registration um, but you will still have to kind of review the final um, registration and just approve it and then um, the um, the attorney would submit it um, on on your behalf. And um, you know, if if the government notifies you um, that you were um, selected, um, you know, like how how will you know you you are um, you know you were selected? So um, normally you would receive an email, um, and then you would log back um, into the USCIS account, and you would see in the system, um, you know, whether um, the registration was um, selected or or not. Perfect. Thank you. And just to, to clarify, so when you're submitting this information in the registration system, is this kind of the entire H-1B petition, like the cover letter, credentials evaluation, or um, what information do you actually have to put into the registration system? Yeah, so um, the, the the information that has to be input, um, so basically there, there are two categories. You will have to input information about the, the U.S. company um, that wants to sponsor um, the employee and then some information about the employee um, you want to sponsor for um, the H-1B visa. So the information about the company um, is information such as, um, you know, the official um, company's name. Um, if there is any DBA um, doing business name, um, you will have to input that. Um, information such as um, the company's office address, um, um, EIN, employer identification number, and then informa information about you, um, you know, like what's your title um, in the company, what's your name, what's your email, what's your phone number, um, just basic information like that. And then for um, the employee, um, you'll have to submit, um, you know, the, the employee's name, um, date of birth, um, country of birth, country of nationality, uh, passport number, and one important information you have to um, submit, um, you know, like kind of like answer for the employee is whether um, you are um, applying under the U.S. master's cap. So as I mentioned in the beginning, there are 20,000 um, kind of slots um, reserved for people who have um, U.S. master's degree. And these people kind of have advantage in the H-1B lottery uh, because their registrations uh, will go through the lottery, um, through the 65,000 um, kind of like slots lottery with everyone else. And then even if they are not selected in this lottery, there is a separate lottery for people uh, with a U.S. master. So they will go through another lottery through the uh, 20,000. And um, so, so yes, they have advantage um, in the in the registration, and so you will have to answer whether or not the employee has um, a U.S. master's degree. So just the government knows, um, you know, through which um, lottery um, the the registration should go. Perfect. Thank you. So it sounds like this is really kind of just the preliminary information, and you're not having to submit you know, a full yeah. petition at this, you, at yeah. this stage. Exactly. Yeah. Like you don't have to submit like any information about the job, like job duties, like nothing like that. Like that will be submitted if the registration is selected in the, in the lottery, like then um, you will need to submit all this information to the government. Perfect. And, and so can an employee file their own registration? Like if, if there's an employee out there who wants to, to submit for the H-1B, can they file the registration? Yeah, so unfortunately not. So um, only um, a U.S. company, like an authorized um, representative of a U.S. company or an attorney um, on behalf of that company can file the, the registration. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, the authorized attorney just has to fill out information, um, you know, about like, um, like what's the, what's the person job title and things like that. So, um, you know, employee um, unfortunately cannot file the, the registration, the employee, you know, or perspective employee just kind of like has to find um, a company in the U.S. that's willing to sponsor um, him, or, him or her and then um, the company or an attorney will file the registration. Perfect. Thank you. And so do applicants who study at kind of U.S. universities have an advantage in the H-1B lottery? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, as I mentioned, the kind of like the um, the applicants who have uh, masters from U.S. university have advantage. If you have a kind of like a bachelor's degree from U.S. university, that doesn't unfortunately help. That that, that just kind of like puts you in the general sixty-five thousand lottery. Um, but if you have a master's from U.S. university, you 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 do have advantage because you basically your registration will go um, through two separate lotteries, so you have higher chance to be selected. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, so I know we talked about kind of qualifying with a U.S. degree or the equivalent. Um, so could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how do you um, get an evaluation of, like, do you need an evaluation of your foreign degree? And what if you only have work experience? Yeah, yeah. So I just want to clarify that you absolutely do not need um, a U.S. degree, like a U.S. bachelor's or master's degree to qualify for an H-1B. So you can have um, a foreign bachelor's degree or a foreign master's degree and still kind of qualify um, for, um, you know, for, for the H-1B. If you do have um, a foreign degree, like foreign bachelor's or a foreign master's degree, um, you would need to get um, kind of that degree um, evaluated. So there are um, specific companies um, that can do these evaluations for you. Um, you would need to submit your degree and your transcript um, to, to these companies. And uh, basically to, um, to be able to kind of qualify for the H-1B, um, the evaluation would have to say that your foreign degree is an equivalent to a U.S. bachelor's or U.S. master's degree. So you can still qualify for an H-1B if you have a foreign degree. It's just um, you would have to have that um, education um, evaluated. Um, you can qualify through work experience. I would say that most people um, applying for an H-1B usually do qualify through um, the kind of the, the bachelor's or master's degree. If you only have work experience and you, you don't have a bachelor's or master's, it is still possible um, to, to qualify, but um, you would need um, a letter from, um, again, from, from, from certain experts or from certain companies that would uh, basically look at your um, work experience and they would need to conclude that um, your work experience is equivalent to at least um, a bachelor's degree. Um, and, and you would need to um, get, get things such as um, letters from your previous employers that would describe uh, what you, what you did for the employer, what kind of what have you did for employers in the past? Um, and yeah, it's just kind of like much more um, kind of like complicated path, uh, but it's, it's, yeah, it's still, it's still, still possible. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so let's say, you know, you, you register um, and then you get the notice that you were selected. Um, so mm -hmm. what does this mean? Does this mean that your H-1B is now pre-approved in any way? Yeah, so um, let's say that you um, receive the notice at the end of March or beginning of April that um, the H-1B registration was selected in the lottery. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't mean the H-1B was approved. Uh, that the 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 um, selection just gives the employer an opportunity to file an H-1B petition um, on behalf of the employee. Um, so if you receive the notification that the registration was approved, you will need to um, submit an H-1B petition um, to USCIS, and then USCIS will make a decision um, whether um, whether or not they are approving the petition. Um, so in the petition, you would need to explain, um, you know, you would need to submit evidence that the employee um, has at least um, a bachelor's degree. Um, you would have to, um, you know, kind of like outline what the job is going to be, you know, like what is the, the job title, what are um, the, the job duties the employee will be uh, performing, um, you would need to kind of like show that the employee's education and the job are kind of like in the same or related field um, and just kind of describe the position um, in the U.S. and the employee's education in detail. And then um, USCIS would um, kind of like make, make a decision on the, on the petition. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so now I think we're going to switch gears a little bit. And I think there are some questions um, that you were going to ask me. Yeah. Um, so, um, so let's say Kelly that the um, H-1B petition is approved by USCIS. Um, like, what's the earliest date um, the employee could start working for the U.S. company? 
Sure. So even though um, you're kind of filing this petition, usually, you know, if you're selected, you're filing it within 90 days after, um, you know, April 1st, uh, the earliest that you can actually start working on the H-1B is October 1st of 2023. Um, so you, you kind of can't start working for the company on H-1B status prior to that October 1st date. And um can um because um th there are a lot of kind of like um filing fees um the, that have to be uh paid um you know when the when the US company is filing the H1B petition. Um can you kind of like go over the fees and whether um the employee can pay um any of these filing fees or the attorney fees? Sure, absolutely. So yes, yeah, so there's usually if you hire an attorney, there's attorney fees. Um, there's also fees for filing certain forms. So you file this petition on what we call a form I-129. Right now, the filing fee for that is $460. Um, there's also like supplementary fees that are just specific to the H-1B. So there's a $500 anti-fraud fee. There's like an, an American Competitiveness in the Workforce Act fee that's either $750 or $1,500, depending on the size of the company. And then for companies that are H-1B dependent employers, there's even additional fees. So I'd say, you know, generally for legal and um, filing fees related to the H-1B petition, the employee is not permitted to pay. Um, you know, there is some kind of flexibility as long if, if some of the fees don't cause the um, the salary to dip a certain amount. But generally, um, you know, as a general matter, you know, to avoid any wage and hour issues, you really want to have um, the employer just pay all of these fees. Um, the one fee that the um, the H one B you know um, employee can pay is they could pay for premium processing. So that's kind of an additional supplementary. Um, you know, fee, and it's okay for the employee to pay for that if they want that expedited service. Um, and then as well, if there's dependents, a spouse or a child under 21, um, the employee can pay for those applications as well um, for the filing fees and for the legal fees. Um, of course, the employer could choose to pay for those, but um, if they choose not to, the employee is permitted to pay. And um, Kelly, do all kind of U.S. Um, employers have to go um, through the, the lottery system in March or um, are there any employers that um, don't have to go through the H-1B lottery and can just kind of like sponsor employees at any time um, throughout the year? Sure. So, um, so not every employer is subject to the to the um, H-1B cap. There's something called a cap exempt employer. Um, so cap exempt employers, you know, get the benefit of being able to uh, file for an H-1B at any time because they're just not subject to this 85,000, um, you know, lot, you know, slot lottery. Um, so in order to qualify, though, you have to either be um, an institution of higher education or a related or affiliated nonprofit entity or a nonprofit organization or governmental research organization. So, um, you know, sometimes universities, for example, um, you know, may, may meet this criteria or research organizations. Um, so it's a good idea as you're looking as an employee for H-1B employers, um, you know, to ask about this, uh, you know, many of the larger nonprofits, um, you know, or research organizations or, or, or universities, you know, are very aware that they're cap exempt and they'll kind of raise that um, proactively, but I think also good just to consider, you know, is this possible, uh, you know, to, to, to go get an H-1B on a cap-exempt employer, um, because that does give you a huge benefit of being able to just avoid the lottery, which is, um, you know, can be, uh, you know, difficult to get selected when you have, you know, so many applicants and so few slots. And, um, uh, does the employer need to pay kind of like any specific um, wage to the to the H-1B employees and how can um, an employer like find out like what's the wage um, they need to they need to pay to the employee? Sure. So for H-1Bs, these are very highly regulated visas and there is a wage requirement. Um, you do have to pay the higher of the actual wage or prevailing wage. So the actual wage is the wage you pay to similar, similarly situated employees within your company that have a similar um, amount of kind of education and experience. And the prevailing wage is based on kind of data that the Department of Labor, um, you know, puts together. And, um, 
you know, there's various databases that basically you can use um, to determine what is the prevailing wage. It's location specific. So you want to determine where is the person actually going to be working. And then you can kind of look up that county, um, you know, look up the wages within that county and determine kind of what is the level of the job. There's four levels from kind of entry level to most experienced. And then um, when you file your labor condition application, you would input on the form um, what the level is, what the wage is, what the location is, and then you're required required to pay, um, you know, at or higher than the prevailing wage when you, um, when the person starts in their H-1B position. And um, okay, let's say that someone, um, you know, an employee is not selected um, in the, in the H-1B registration. Um, what other visa options um, does the employee have? Um, like, let's say, you know, there is like a student on um, F1 OPT um, in the US and um, he or she, they don't get selected in the in the lottery. Uh, what can they do? Um, like what visas um, can they apply for to, to stay in the US? Sure. So, um, you know, we'll talk about kind of some, you know, some other options. Um, I think, you know, you know, one option, let's say that you're an Australian national, um, there's a visa called the E3 visa, which is a great visa. Um, and, you know, allows you essentially it has all the same um, all the same things available as the H-1B. It has very similar criteria to the H-1B, but what it doesn't have is this kind of cap. Um, you know, there is a cap, but it's almost never reached because it's only available to Australian nationals. Um, and, and you can kind of apply for this at any time. So if you are an Australian national, uh, you know, you should probably go for the E3, you know, I think like almost more than even, um, you know, doing the H-1B lottery. There may be reasons down the line if you wanted to apply for a green card that you might go for the H-1B. Um, but the E-3, you know, you can apply for it any time. You're not subject to this to this cap. And if you're eligible under the H-1B standards, you would also be eligible under the E-3 standards because they're essentially the same, uh, just with this difference of E-3s only being available to Australian nationals. Um, another option potentially are, um, you know, the TN visa. So uh, this is available only to Canadian and Mexican nationals um, and is limited to um, a list of professions that's available under the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Um, you know, various professions, for example, accountant, architect, uh, economist, um, management consultant. And again, you know, the TN is, you know, generally if you're um, eligible for the H-1B um, and you have a bachelor's degree or equivalent. Um, and uh, so in the TN context, you're not always going to be able to use work experience the same way that you could with the H-1B. Um, there are some categories that only permit you to use, um, you know, the actual degree, but there are some categories that allow you to use experience, for example, the management consultant. So if you are a Canadian or Mexican national, it's worth kind of looking at um, the list of professions to see if that may be an option for you. Um, Another potential option um, is the E-2 visa, and this is limited to treaty country nationals. So there's a long list of treaty countries, um, you know, from all over the world, you know, Canada, the United Kingdom, um, you know, France, Italy, uh, you know, um, not China or India, unfortunately, uh, but many, many countries. And this is if, if somebody is potentially, um, you know, has a significant amount of money to invest and has kind of entrepreneurial aspirations and wants to actually run a company, um, this is a potential option that you could consider. So sometimes on OPT, sometimes students actually, instead of getting an employer, will run their own company. Or perhaps they were working for an employer, but their plan in the future was always to kind of start their own company. So perhaps if they weren't selected for the H-1B lottery and this was in their plans, you know, this is something they could just kind of do a little bit sooner. Um, another potential visa, and this is this would really, um, you know, is the O-1 visa, but this would really only be appropriate, you know, not really for, for students. These are for pe people of extraordinary ability who have, you know, risen to the very top of their field or, you know, have distinction in their field. But, you know, if, for example, let's say that you um, had a career in your home country and then you came to the United States, you know, and perhaps you've been working for many, many years, but you're getting a master's, you're getting a PhD or something like that, um, you know, in your field, um, as long as you had that proof of your extraordinary ability, um, you know, from your prior work experience, that's something you could consider as well. But I think it's likely not going to be an option for people that perhaps this is their first degree and they don't really have work experience. Um, you know, the O-1 would not be not be appropriate for them. Um, so, you know, 
Other things that people will sometimes do perhaps is um, sometimes students will continue their education. You know, perhaps they got uh, a bachelor's degree and they plan to get a master's in the future, but wanted to work first. Um, perhaps they work for a year on OPT and the H-1B, you know, they're not selected in the lottery. They could always, you know, choose to go back to school, um, you know, get their master's or get their PhD. At each level that you advance, you would get another potential year of OPT or even potentially more if you're eligible for that STEM OPT extension. Um, so those are kind of all, you know, creative options that people will sometimes use if they're not selected in the lottery. And Kelly, um, what happens like with um, students who um, study in the U.S. and then they are in the U.S. on, on an OPT? Um, let's say that their registration is um, like selected in the lottery and then the, the U.S. company is filing the H-1B petition, but their let's say their OPT expires in like June, July. Um, so you said that the earliest they can start working on the H-1B is October 1st. So would they need to kind of like stop working like in the period they don't have after the OPT expiration or um, like what, what can they do? Sure. So um, so they could take advantage of something called cap gap. Um, and this is something that was basically developed because of the exact problem that you outlined, right, where you have people and they're, you know, maybe they're working for a company and their OPT is ending, you know, in June or July, but they're not getting um, that H-1B authorization until um, October 1st. So CapCap allows these students to basically extend their F1 status up until the date the H1B, um, you know, starts. Um, so this is only available if you're filing for a change of status as opposed to consular processing. And you're only eligible as long as you're maintaining your F1 status on the date the H1B petition is filed. So in the example you gave like a student who's here, they have OPT and it expires in you know June or July, um, and they filed for a change of status to H1B, um, as long as their H-1B petition is filed before their OPT expires, they actually will be able to stay in the United States and keep working up until October 1st when they change to H-1B status. Um, now, let's say that you had somebody who, uh, you know, perhaps their OPT ended maybe, um, you know, in, in the middle of March, but now they're on their 60-day grace period. Um, as long as their H-1B petition was selected, and they filed for a change of status, they would be permitted to stay in the United States, um, essentially, you know, considered to be on F1 status up until their uh, the change of status happened in Oct on October 1st. However, they wouldn't be get that benefit of being able to continue working uh, because their OPT would have expired before the H-1B petition was filed. So um, always important to look at kind of the OPT dates. Um, but if you do have, you know, an OPT that's expiring in, you know, uh, like late spring or the summer or late summer, you know, you should be in a good position to, um, you know, get your, uh, your work authorization extended up until October 1st. Thank you. Perfect. And um, just one thing, um, a question to clarify, does the employee like have to be in the in the US, um, you know, to be able to be sponsored for the H1B or can the employee be um, kind of like outside the US and um, the, the company can still sponsor the employee for the H1B? Yeah, so they don't have to be in the United States. Um, you know, if, if let's say that somebody was outside the United States, um, you can still submit a registration, you can still submit an H-1B petition. But if they're outside the U.S., you would have to file that petition for what we call consular processing. So once USCIS approved the H-1B petition, um, then the applicant um, could go and get an H-1B visa stamp, um, you know, and then enter the U.S., uh, you know, before their, uh, you know, before their kind of right, you know, right before their H-1B job started. Um, so that, that that is possible to do. It's not a requirement that you're already in the United States, uh, you know, to, to get the H-1B. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I think we have one question. Um, so someone is asking, um, I have a U.S. bachelor's um, degree and 13 years of experience. Um, is it possible to apply without a job offer? And what are my chances? Right. So I think, um, Michaela, I think you covered this a little earlier in the uh, in, in the presentation. So you do have to have a job offer. Um, the employee themselves cannot submit a registration. Uh, you know, it, uh, you're not allowed to kind of self petition for an H-1B. You do need a job offer from a from a U.S. employer in order to, you know, to apply for the H-1B petition. Yeah. Perfect. So I think um, I think those are all the questions that we had. Um, 
I don't see any more coming in. So Michaela, thank you so much for um, you know sharing your knowledge and for your time today. I hope this was helpful for everyone and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.